Well, good morning, First Melissa. It is good to see you all. We're glad you're here. We're going to start things off here in a sec. And uh, the first thing we want to do, as always, is just to thank you for coming. We're glad to see you today, and it's good to have you with us, whether you're joining us in the room or if you're joining us online. Uh, we are glad that you're here, and uh, we just can't wait to see what our God has in store for us today, because it's always good. And uh, so we're excited to see that. Uh, we're going to bow together and pray and uh, spend some time together worshiping our Savior, our King, our Maker. Uh, so let's bow together. God, we thank you for this day. God, we do thank you for the chance to come just to, to be here together in your house. We thank you for the chance to come and sing your praises. And God, we just pray that during this time this morning, as we lift up our, our voices to you and our hearts to you, uh, we just pray that our worship would just draw us close to you. God, let it remind us of all that you are for us. God, let it remind us of your holiness and your grace and your mercy. And uh, we just, God, we just want to uh, be reminded of just how awesome you are. Uh, speak to us, God, through the power of your word. God, let us leave this place changed today because we've been in your presence. Father, we love you and we pray all of these things in your precious name. Amen. All right, well, let's lift our voices together. We are here today to worship the King of Kings. Let's do that together. You're coming into focus We're going back to the basics The glory of your face is the reason why we do this The winds of worship blowing Yeah, the doors of heaven open Lord, help us to remember the reason why we do this. It's all about you. Yes, it's all. It's all about 
for a moment. Pastor Trey is going to come. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We are so glad you are here today. It is a beautiful day to celebrate the Lord and to sing his praises. We welcome those who are watching online. Of course, we welcome our friends in the room. It is a great day to be here and a great day to worship together. We always have guests on a Sunday morning, and we would love to welcome you personally. If you are in the room and you received a worship guide that looks like this, there's a spot, if you would, to give us a bit of your information so we can say hello to you. This little tear-off slip in the back, that's what it's for. If you'll give us a bit of your contact information, we want to reach out and say hello to you. You can tear that off and drop it in one of the offering boxes in this room or in the hallways. We'd love to say hello to you. We also offer each time we get together to pray with you, and there's lots of ways to do that. At the end of our service, our prayer team will be here at the front of the stage. If you'd like for someone to pray with you personally, you're welcome after our service to visit our prayer room, which is right outside that door. You could use this tear-off slip and write a prayer need down or the easy email address, prayer at firstmelissa.com. But it's our privilege each week, dozens of people allow us to pray over their needs, and we would love to do that if you would allow us to do so. We have a busy week ahead inside your worship guide and on our mobile app. You'll see lots of things happening. We gather every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. for what we call Torah Tuesday. We study the weekly Torah portion together. We gather together on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. We have ministries for kids and teenagers and adults. I'm teaching a study about the geography of the land of Israel and the history on Wednesday evenings at 6.30. So you are invited to be a part of that. There's a dinner each Wednesday at 5.30 if you register ahead of time. And then our ministries begin at 6.30. Also, this Friday night is our Passover dinner, our Seder meal. It is 6 p.m. this Friday. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a full meal. You do need a ticket for it. You can stop by the hub today, <coughs> excuse me, and pick up a ticket. There are a few left. Or the website is firstmelissa.com slash celebrate. <coughs> <clears throat> Forgive me. Also, it is about to be the end of school time. So, for Mother's Day, we have Child Dedication Day on May 12th that you can register and be a part of. And then our graduating high school seniors will be recognized the following Sunday, May 19. So, if you're a gr either end of the parenting scale there, the new ones or the graduating seniors, we'd love to recognize them on those two Sundays in a row. And then last of all, parents of preschoolers and grade schoolers, VBS, Vacation Bible School is coming. And there's two different weeks. The first one is preschool VBS. And the next week is grade school VBS. And so you can go ahead and register your kids and grandkids for what will be a great, great week for them this summer. We're going to talk about Passover. We're going to continue our series called A Mighty Hand in a few minutes, but I want to thank you for being with us. Also want to thank you for praying and for inviting folks and for volunteering and for giving of your tithes and offerings. This is all the ways we work together to do ministry together. There's lots of ways to give of your tithes and offerings. You can use the Venmo app. You can use the mobile app on, our, uh, on your smartphone. You can use the church website firstmelissa.com slash give, or if you prefer to give by cash or check, that's what the offering boxes in this room and in the hallway are for. Thank you for doing ministry with us in lots of different ways. Thank you for singing and praising the Lord with us, and so let's do it. Amen. Well, let's continue singing songs of worship and songs of praise to our God. We're going to lift him up together.
Thank you for being with us today. Our teaching series is titled, A Mighty Hand. We began the series talking about the creator God, Genesis chapter 1. The God who said, let there be light, Yahi or, and there was light. 
the mighty hand of God, seeing the power of God at work. Well, it is a very important day. It's a very important week. This is Passover week. And Passover is the holiday of freedom. And we're going to talk about what that means. Freedom, physical even more importantly, spiritual freedom. In the book of Exodus chapter 6, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh, that's the leader of Egypt. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. The teaching series is called A Mighty Hand, and one of the most evident stories, the most Famous stories of the mighty hand of God at work is the Passover story. If you were to look at a calendar, a Hebrew calendar, then you would see that Passover begins on the 15th day of the month of Nisan. On our calendar this year, Gregorian calendar, that is tomorrow night at sundown. Tomorrow night at sundown, Monday evening, is when Passover begins. Many people around the world, Jews and some followers of Jesus, Christian Gentiles, will celebrate Passover. Our family will. Maybe you came in the front doors today and you saw a demonstration of our Passover table as you walked in. And it begins a week-long festival. And some people ask, how long does Passover last? Because it's not just one day. Well, the scriptures speak of really two separate events that have come to be understood to be the same lengthy event. Passover is a single day, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a seven-day festival, and they're always talked about together. The 15th day of Nisan is the observance of the Passover Immediately followed by this seven-day festival, the festival of matzah, the unleavened bread. So the entire holiday is eight days, and that's what is beginning tomorrow night at sundown. And you ask a lot of questions about this holiday, and why is it so important? And we've got a couple of articles I want to show you. Here's a summary of one of them on the screen. Why is Passover so important? Six reasons, as you can see on the screen. Number one, God delivered the Jewish people from 400 years of slavery, which we'll read about in a moment. God showed his power through the miracles surrounding Passover, his mighty hand at work. God reaffirmed his covenant with Abraham and further set apart the Jewish people as his chosen people. God called the Jewish people out to give them a land of their own. God established a watershed for the Jewish people and an inheritance of faith to pass on. And God revealed a prophetic glimpse of the promised Messiah's sacrificial death. And we have some in our room here and some in our congregation who are Jews, but most are not. And you may be asking, well, why does this apply to me? Because if you are a follower of Jesus, then your Savior is a Jew, lived as a Jew. Celebrated Passover himself, which I'll show you in just a moment. Now, the same question, why is Passover so important? But this is an article, and it's going to be on the screen for you. And the font is a bit small, so I want to read it to you. Not only does Passover serve as a reminder of God's faithfulness, but it points to the Lamb of God, the Messiah, who served as a once-for-all sacrifice for sin. This is why God commanded the Jewish people to observe the Feast of Passover from generation to generation. Year after year, Passover reminds the Jewish people of the Lord's faithfulness to his promises. God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations and that his descendants would inherit the land of Israel as an eternal possession. But years later, the Jewish people found themselves enslaved in the land of Egypt. It would be understandable if they questioned God's faithfulness since the promise of a homeland seemed to have been broken. But God proved faithful and raised up a deliverer, Moses, to lead his people into freedom. When Pharaoh refused to let the Jewish people go, God sent ten plagues, the tenth being the death of all firstborn sons. 
Although the plague would have impacted everyone, God provided the way for Israel to be saved. All those who put the blood of an unblemished lamb on the doorposts and lintels of their home were passed over by the angel of death. And the lives of their firstborn sons were spared. The death of Pharaoh's firstborn son drove him to release the Israelites. And God delivered them with a mighty outstretched arm. Passover is also significant because it points to an even greater event than that of the Exodus. The death of the ultimate Passover lamb, Yeshua the Messiah, who redeems us from sin. Yeshua laid his life down on Passover, fulfilling the requirements of the sacrificial system. And it continues one more slide. The Passover lamb was unblemished. Yeshua was similarly untainted by sin. In the same way, the high priest transferred a Jewish person's sins onto an innocent lamb as a substitutionary sacrifice, our sins Yeshua took upon himself, both cases of the innocent dying for the guilty. Prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 53, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Just as the Jewish people were saved from the death of the firstborn by applying the Passover lamb's blood to their homes. Those who place Yeshua's blood on the doorposts of their hearts will be saved from spiritual death. Passover thus reminds us of God's faithfulness in not only delivering his chosen people from bondage in Egypt, but also of delivering us from our sins by sending the Lamb of God, Yeshua the Messiah. So if you ask the question, why is Passover so important? Because it was monumentally important in the life of the Jewish people. And don't forget, if the enemy of God, Satan, has his way, And defeats and kills all the Jewish people as he has tried to do every generation. If he is successful, where do we find our Messiah? Where do we find our Savior? This is why it's so important for followers of Jesus to understand Passover. Because it was monumentally important to Jesus himself. But before we even get to the story of Passover, we have to back up in time. And reminds you that in the book of Genesis, God made a promise to a man named Abram. You know him later as Abraham. And God made a promise that he would give him a land as an eternal inheritance, an eternal possession. God repeated that promise to his son, Isaac, also in the book of Genesis. And then the promise was repeated to the third generation, the grandson whose name is Jacob. And the promise was that God would give one land to one people. But when Jacob is leading the people of Israel, there's a problem. There's a famine in the land of Israel. It's called the land of Canaan at the time. There's a famine. There's no food. They've got to go somewhere where they have food. And because of the work of God in a guy's life named Joseph, not the Joseph of the Gospels, but the Old Testament man named Joseph, a Jew who had helped the people of Egypt prepare for a famine. The nation of Egypt had food when no one else did. So the people of Jacob's family, Jacob whose other name is Israel, had to travel to Egypt simply to survive. We'll show you a map. You see the green, fertile area on this satellite imagery of the land of Egypt. It's what it looked like 3,000 years ago. It's what it looks like today. Egypt is a desert except where the Nile River and all of its tributaries flow. And then it's very, very green and very fertile. They had crops. They had food. So the people of Jacob, whose other name is Israel, came down to Egypt to survive. To have food to eat. And God had arranged the circumstances 
that one of Jacob's own sons named Joseph would be the second in command of Egypt and welcome his family and provide them something to eat and a place to live. That ends the book of Genesis in your Bible. And if you then would begin the book of Exodus, chapter 1, the people of Israel or the people of Jacob who came down to Egypt with Jacob are all mentioned there. These are his brothers. And you probably will notice the names because these are the tribes of Israel. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. It says Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty. So the land of Egypt was filled with the people of Israel. And then in a hugely important verse in your Bible, Exodus chapter 1 verse 8. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Generations of the people of Egypt survived because of Joseph and his planning and his administration. But a new king arose who didn't know him. You say, how is that possible? Well, there's a lot of theories. It's been maybe a hundred years since Joseph did what he did. Maybe you've heard of the guy, but you don't remember why he's important and nobody remembers him much and that king doesn't have any allegiance to him. That's one theory. Another theory is that the land of Egypt was fought over and you have different rulers And then someone else would conquer, and now they're in charge, and someone else would conquer. And one of the theories is somebody has taken over, and they literally did not know Joseph. So they surely have no allegiance to Joseph's descendants and his family. And the leader of Egypt has the title of Pharaoh. It's not a proper name. It's a title. It's like king or president or Caesar. It's a title. And the Pharaoh said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply. And in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So what you have going on in Exodus chapter 1, 3,500 years ago, is a statement by a world leader who says... These Jews are not like us. We don't want them here. We need to deal with them. If you were to look up the speeches of Hitler in Nazi Germany, it would sound a lot like this. But there's a quote on the bottom of the screen right now. And I need to tell you this quote was written in 1706. It has been the policy of persecutors to represent God's Israel as a dangerous people, hurtful to kings and provinces, not fit to be trusted, not fit to be tolerated, that they may have some pretense for the barbarous treatment they designed them. 1706, Matthew Henry, a Bible commentator, said it's gone on for generations that world leaders find a way to justify their hatred for the Jews and their violent treatment of the Jews. It's what happened with Pharaoh. It's what happened in Nazi Germany. And guess what? It's what happens this week. Let me show you two news articles. The one on the left from the Jerusalem Post. This is about the university in New York called Columbia. And the headline says, Violence Against Jewish Students on Campus is Imminent. And this famous, highly respected university has been taken over by the anti-Israel mob. And what did they shout this week? Look on the right. It's a tweet, but it's a quote. Never forget the 7th of October. Do you know what that was? That was the date that Hamas attacked Israel and killed more than 1,200 people. 
Never forget the 7th of October. That will not happen one more time, not five more times, not 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. The 7th of October is going to be every day for you. These are supposedly the best and brightest students in an Ivy League school in America this week. And they're saying the 7th of October is going to be every day for you. So when we talk about Passover, that God delivered his people from those who hated them and wanted, wanted to kill them, this is not a history lesson. This is a read your newspaper today lesson. So the Pharaoh had to come up with a strategy to deal with these people he didn't want. Exodus 1, verse 11, the Egyptians appointed taskmasters over the people of Israel to afflict them with hard labor. They built for the Pharaoh storage cities, Pitam and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and the more they spread out. So they were in dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field. All their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. So the people of Israel began to beg God, please deliver us. Please get us out of this. Please allow us to go back to the land that you promised to us. Please send us a leader to deliver us. At the same time, God is working in the heart of a man named Moses who used to live in Egypt. But he's a fugitive of the law. And for the last 40 years, he's been living in the Sinai Peninsula with the Midianites. And in Exodus chapter 3, God speaks to Moses at the famous story called the burning bush. The bush that was on fire, but it says it was not consumed. It did not disintegrate. And Moses' attention is caught by the bush. And God calls to him and says, Moses. And he says, here I am. And God says, don't come near here. For the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. Remove the sandals from your feet. God says, I'm the God of your father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The Lord says, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have given heed to their cry. I am aware of their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them, to bring them to a good and spacious land. And then God says in verse 10, I'm going to send you, Moses, to the Pharaoh. If we read our history books, this is probably the man whose title, whose title is Pharaoh, whose name is Amenhotep II. This is the Pharaoh of the timeline, we believe. So that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said, who am I that I should go? Who am I to be the deliverer? And God says, I will be with you. And then you will worship me again when you come out at this mountain. And Moses said, I'm going to go say the God of your fathers has sent me. And they may say, what is his name? What should I answer that? And the Lord said that famous phrase, Aye, Eser, Aye. I am who I am. Or it could be translated not present tense, but future tense. I will be what I will be. And we've taken that to be the name Yahweh. That's who sent you. And in Exodus 3 verse 20, the Lord says, So I will stretch out my hand, his mighty hand, and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I will do in the midst of it. And after that, after the miracles, he, the Pharaoh, will let you go. Well, what happens then is Moses, along with his older brother Aaron, would have repeated conversations with the Pharaoh. Our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Hebrews, says, let our people go. And the Pharaoh would say, no, and who's your God to tell me what to do? And who are you to tell me what to do? And he understood that his economy would de be decimated if his entire labor force left. And he repeatedly said no, and then... God would touch his heart and he would say yes and then immediately he would change his mind and, and break an agreement and over and over again. And so what did God do? He sent a series of miracles or signs. We call them the ten plagues. 
And the list is on the screen. The water is turned to blood. Frogs, gnats, flies, a plague on the livestock, boils and sores on people's skin, hail and lightning, locusts, darkness, and then the tenth and final plague, the death of the firstborn. And if, if you see this Seder meal table that, that's outside in the foyer, you'll see little toys representing the different plagues to teach children the plagues. So after the tenth and final plague, a period of time we think lasts about nine months in length. Finally, the Pharaoh says the people may go. But on the night of the death of the firstborn, the people of Israel participate in the original Passover. And that's Exodus chapter 12. And that's what I want to read for you. And if you have your own text and You can read along with us, Exodus chapter 12. Verse 1 says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It's originally called the month of Abib, and later the name is Nisan. This shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. That is the month we are in right now on our calendar. Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying on the tenth of this month, Tenth day of Nisan, they are to each one take a lamb for themselves. According to their father's household, a lamb for each household. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons, according to what each man should eat. Divide the lamb. Your lamb should be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. See, you gather your lamb on the 10th day of the month of Nisan. And then you inspect it for four days to see if it truly is unblemished. Now for those of us who follow after Jesus, I want you to understand what happened during Passion Week. What we call Palm Sunday would have been the 10th day of Nisan. And what did... Jesus experienced for the next four days, he was tested, he was inspected, he was put on trial to see if he was truly unblemished and spotless. You take a lamb on the 10th day of Nisan and for four days you see if it's really qualified. Jesus was questioned many times during that Passion Week. He was put on trial In the middle of the night before he went to the cross. And in every instance he was proven to be sinless and perfect and unblemished. And on the 14th day of Nisan that's when the lamb is sacrificed. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus our Passover lamb. What are you supposed to do after the lamb is slaughtered? Exodus 12 verse 7. Take some of the blood. Put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat. So watch me here. Watch me. Here's my door. I put it on the lintel. That's the top of the door. And I put it one on this side and one on this side. So three spots. I'm to take the blood of the spotless lamb and put it on the lintel and on the two doorposts of my house. They shall eat the flesh the same night roasted with fire. Eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not leave any of it left over until the morning. And then it continues in verse 11. Eat it in this manner with your loins girded. You know what that means, gentlemen? If you have a long robe, you kind of roll up, cinch up your robe and tuck it in your belt so you can run. With your sandals on your feet. And your staff in your hand and eat it in haste. Why? Because they're going to have to leave quickly. It is the Lord's Passover. The Hebrew noun of Pesach. Which is the name of the holiday. God speaking. I will go through the land of Egypt on that night. And will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Both man and beast. Against the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood I will pass over. So you've got a noun and now a verb. Same root. Pasach is the verb. Pesach is the noun. 
When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. It continues, verse 14, this will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. In a moment when I show you that Jesus himself celebrated Passover, Jesus lived 1,400 years after the book of Exodus. So 1,400 years later, the Jewish people were still keeping the permanent ordinance in every generation as God had instructed them to do. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you will remove the leaven. It's called hamets from your houses. On the first day you'll have a holy assembly you'll have an, or a worship service. You'll also have one on the seventh day. You shall observe the feast of matzah, the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. You shall observe this throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. And when, what are the dates? It's the next Part of Exodus 12, the 14th month of Nisan until the 21st day, seven days. Have no leaven in your house. So this is the instruction that God gave to Moses. So Moses then went to the leaders of the people of Israel and laid out for them the same thing. He relayed the message. Take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Pesach, the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop. It's a plant. It's it acts as a sponge. Dip it in the blood in the basin and put the, base, uh, the blood in the basin to the lentil and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lentil and the two doorposts, next verse, the Lord will pass over the door. Pesach, the verb, or Pasach, the verb, and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. You shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. And when you enter the land that the Lord has promised, you will observe this right. And when your children ask, what is this about? You'll say it was when the Lord passed over us and we were spared. And the people bowed low and worshipped. And in verse 28 it says the sons of Israel did and went as the Lord had commanded. Then there was the death of the firstborn sons. And the people of Egypt wailing and crying including the Pharaoh himself lost his own firstborn son. And so he says leave. Get out of here. We've been Punished, we've been defeated by the true God. So that's the end of Exodus 12. The people of Israel leave, but I'm going to put a map on the screen for you. This is the red line on the map is the wilderness journey, 40 years of wilderness journey. That's another lesson for another day. You see where the red line starts on the left of the map. That's in the land of Goshen where they lived, and they'll end up in the land of Israel on the top right of the red line. But Exodus 12, verse 40 says, the sons of Israel lived in Egypt for 430 years. Well, generations earlier, God had told Abraham, your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. They will be enslaved for 400 years, but I will judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. So what did God do at the end of the Passover story as he fulfilled the promise that was made to Abram. Later on in the Torah is the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a series of sermons and speeches from Moses to the people of Israel. Right before he dies, he's giving his final teachings. And in Deuteronomy 16, he says, Observe the month of Abib, or later called Nisan, celebrate the Passover. Sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God. And then later on, halfway down, you're not allowed to sacrifice the Passover, the Passover in any of the towns, but the place where the Lord your God chooses. You had to go to the tabernacle, or later you had to go to the temple to sacrifice this. And you would sacrifice the Passover in the evening, the afternoon, at sunset. And then later on in Deuteronomy, Moses would tell the people in chapter 26... The Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us as he looks back at the experience. 
Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers. The Lord heard our voice, saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now that's 3,400 years ago. The first Passover. But I told you that if you jump forward in time 1,400 years to the time of Jesus in the Gospels, the Jewish people are still celebrating the Passover. How do we know that? Because it's told to us all over the Gospels. One of the most famous stories about the life of Jesus is when he was age 12, his earthly mother and father, Joseph and Mary, took him to Jerusalem, and then they were starting the journey back home. This is found in Luke chapter 2, back north to Nazareth. And at the end of a day's journey, they couldn't find him. He's 12 years of age. And look what it says on Luke 2, 41, at the beginning of that passage. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So that famous age 12 story, everybody's probably heard that about where's Jesus? He's with you. No, he's with you. Oh, no. And then mom starts to panic. But why were they in Jerusalem in the first place? They were there for Passover. But it wasn't unusual. It says they went there every year. Now, this is when Jesus is age 12. You move forward to age 30 when he begins his public ministry. And not surprisingly, what does Jesus do? He celebrates Passover As an adult. And we always tell you that Jesus' earthly ministry was about three years or three and a half years long. How do we know that? There's no verse that says Jesus' ministry was three years. We don't have a verse that says that. How do we know it? Because we can count the number of Passovers he celebrated. John's gospel says he celebrated three different Passovers. John chapter 2, John chapter 6, and then John 11, 12, 13, all of that's the same one because that's the one that's connected to the Last Supper and the crucifixion. So we know his ministry was a little over three years because he celebrated three different Passovers. And then that third and final Passover, this is the story that I've taught you where the disciples said, hey, Jesus, where do you want us to prepare for you the Passover? And he says, go find a man. He's going to show you a place A large furnished upper room and we'll have our Passover there. The Last Supper. That's the final third Passover of his earthly ministry. And that's when Jesus took the bread and the cup. And he said this bread that's broken, this matzah bread, the unleavened bread represents my body that's going to be broken. And this cup of wine represents my blood that's going to be shed. All of that happened at a Passover meal like we are going to have this Friday. And the ingredients of a Passover meal, we're going to talk a lot about this Friday, but here's a a photo of a place setting with the ingredients. Matzah bread, zeroa, karpas, maror, haraset, beitza. Well, you'll learn all of that if you join us on Friday. And why do we, who are not Jews, celebrate Passover Because our Savior did, our Messiah did. And what is the significance of Passover? It's the deliverance from slavery. Leviticus 26, 13. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so you would not be slaves. Deuteronomy 5. Remember you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out. How? By a mighty hand. Jesus said in John 8, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. And Romans 6, the Apostle Paul says, Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart and you became slaves of righteousness. So the whole story of Passover is the story of freedom from slavery. And I hope you know here on day 198 of a war between Israel and Hamas. There are still 133 hostages remaining in Gaza, including a one-year-old baby boy. And the news reports keep getting more and more grim about how many are thought to still be alive. For a while, people were saying they think a half, one half of the 133 were alive. Now they're starting to think it's one-third are still alive. No one knows for sure. But for 198 days, the families of these hostages have been begging God for their loved ones to be released from slavery. 
And so what many people are doing this Passover season is they are setting an extra place setting and an extra chair at their Passover table to be left empty in honor of the hostages. See, on Passover, everyone would gather their own lamb. And by the time the temple was built in Jerusalem, this is where everyone would come and they would bring their their sacrificial lamb to the priest at the temple. And the lamb would be sacrificed. And the priest would blow the shofar, the ram's horn, at 3 p.m. And guess what happened? Outside the city walls, at 3 p.m. on what we now call Good Friday, the Lamb of God hung on a cross. And he cried out, Lama, la, uh, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. It's Aramaic. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it says in the ninth hour of the day. Well, you start the clock at 6 a.m. Ninth hour is 1,500 hours. That's 3 p.m. At the same moment inside the city walls when the priests are sacrificing the lambs on the altar in the temple. At the same moment the Lamb of God is outside the city walls on the cross and he's being sacrificed. Because he is our Passover lamb. Remember the instruction to place the blood on the doorposts and the lintel? Look at this graphic. You're supposed to put the blood of the spotless lamb on the lintel. That's the top and the left and the right. See, it forms a triangle of human beings trying to reach up to God. And then you jump forward in time 1,400 years and you have Jesus hanging on a cross And there's also three spots of blood. There's the two feet stuck together and the two hands. And now the arrow's pointing down. God is reaching down to us. But what happens when you put the two together? Us reaching up to God and God reaching down to us. The six-pointed star. Some call the star of David. We'll finish with 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The apostle Paul is their teacher and their pastor. And he's, he's teaching them a lot of things. And he says, your boasting is not good. Which is a part of the conversation that we've jumped into the middle of here. And he says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. See, in Passover, you don't have leaven. Leaven is yeast, and you have this bread without yeast, bread that has not risen, because leaven is a symbol for sin. Why? Because what does the leaven do to the bread? It makes it rise. It puffs it up. What is the fundamental sin behind every sin? It's that we have the sin of pride. We are puffed up you say well it's about lust and it's about anger and it's about hatred and it's about murder and it's about stealing yes but every sin begins with pride that I get to make the rules I get to do what I want to do every sin begins with pride we are puffed up leaven is a symbol for sin he says get rid of the leaven the puffed upness the pride in your life And then he says, for Messiah, our Passover, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so this week, many of us will celebrate Passover. You're being taught about Passover. Why? Because fundamentally, the title of Jesus Christ is that he is our Passover lamb. He's creator of the world. He's king. He's teacher. All of those things are true. But he's only qualified to be all of those things if he fulfills his mission. And his mission was to be our Passover lamb. So we celebrate Passover this week. We'll have a whole meal together on Friday if you make a reservation and join us. 
for the purpose of understanding that we are slaves to our sin and God set us free with the Passover lamb who is Jesus. And now let's pray about it. God, we pray for our understanding that you sent your only son who was gathered on the 10th day of Nisan, was inspected for the whole of the Passion Week, found to be spotless, unblemished, and sinless. And then at the very moment in the temple when a lamb, an animal was being sacrificed, the Lamb of God, Jesus, was being sacrificed to release us from slavery, to release us from bondage. God, we pray again for the hostages in Gaza to come home. And we pray that those who are spiritual hostages, those who have never received the freedom of Jesus, that hearts would be changed. This Passover week, we would recognize who our Passover lamb is. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. These folks are here to pray with you if you would like. Hag Sameach. Happy Passover.